I'm not sure why that song, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year, is really not sung in Lent. Um, it's a time where lives are changed, souls are sanctified. Uh, for those of you who are walking in, the sheets are next to uh, Karam, um, on, on, just on the sheet. Every other one is blank, so take one that has typing. Um, again, it, it's a time where hopefully souls are sanctified, sins are washed away, new life is bestowed, and the heavens are truly rejoicing. But that's if we take advantage. We're starting a new series, and this could possibly be the most important series this church could ever have. Now to introduce this, I wanted to talk to you about standards. Yes, standards. Try to stay awake. Do you know what a standard is? You're like, uh, maybe. Here it is. I found a definition. It's a level of quality, achievement, that is considered acceptable or desirable. Pretty simple. We all live by them. We all live by standards, and I'm sure you would agree. We all have a certain standard of living in regards to where we're willing to live. The size of the house, the car that we drive, the pictures that you're willing to post of yourself on Facebook. On Facebook. Even more higher is the standard that you're allowing others of put pictures of you on Facebook. Right? We all have standards, so many of them. We like having standards most of the time. Would you agree that if you had no standards, that having no standards or going below your standards at times could be absolutely repulsive? How many of you would be willing to live here? How many of you would be willing to eat this? How many of you would be willing to have a hairstyle like this? We all have standards. Hopefully you've risen above certain standards. And having low standards or no standards at all is actually insulting, right? You say, oh, that person has such low standards. Let me ask you, have you set standards for your life as a Christian? This is a tough question, but I think it's one that you have to answer. Have you thought about it? Have you set standards for your Christian living? For your Christian giving? For the way you pray and the way you play? For the way you fast and the way that you feast? Is our standard, I won't go to church before a certain time because it's too boring. I won't read the Bible if it's too late. I won't stand to pray if I'm already tired. And I won't fast without soy barbecue ribs. So who chose your standards for you? Sometimes the standards of our Christianity are set by the Christians around us. Is that good or bad? It depends on the Christians you're with. There's this concept in America, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he called it cheap grace. I don't know if you've seen or heard this type of Christianity. It's actually very common. It goes something like this. God loves you. He died for you. Accept His love. Once you do, you're saved. There's really not a whole lot more that you have to do. Worship songs are going to be fun. Prayer, church services are going to be short. And just know that you're going to go to heaven and God wants you to be happy. Come to church and do some good stuff. I mean, be comfortable. Be happy. For many, that is the standard of Christianity around us. I know that's somewhat exaggerated. I know that it's somewhat totally true. There was once a standard of Christianity set by some people, and a famous person, he observed the Christianity in this land, and he said this. This is a great person, and I love this quote. I love your Christ. I do not love your Christians. They are nothing like your Christ. What was the standard of Christianity that Gandhi was exposed to? It was Christianity in name, but not in practice. It was a kind of standard that brought God a bad name. It's a kind of Christianity, as it talks about in Romans, that 
People blaspheme God because of you. I was listening to a, a talk show on Christian radio this week, and this pastor was saying how appalled he is. There's this movie that came out yesterday for Valentine's weekend called Fifty Shades of Grey. Apparently, it is a horribly unchristian view of love. Horribly. I mean, I heard it's... It, don't watch it. He's saying that the statistics of movie ticket sales went up four times than usual in the Bible Belt. Four times as many people are watching it in the Bible Belt than they usually go to the movies. The book, 50% of females apparently have read it. And 50% of Christian females have read it. Apparently the standard for Christians has oftentimes become the same standard as those who are atheist and have no God. <laughs> and I guess it goes back to the question, what standard have we set? Is our gospel a modified gospel, a watered down gospel, a negotiated gospel? Is our gospel a compromised gospel? What if our standards bring God shame? What if our standards are a watered down compromised gospel? When is it that you decide to raise your standards? Well, let me ask you, is it good for you to set your own standard of Christianity? Is it good for you to set the standards of your Christianity? And one word, no. <laughs> We're not designing our own Christianity. We're not picking and choosing. Oftentimes, if we leave it up to ourselves, we're going to be set, tempted to set a very mediocre standard, or maybe none at all. What's the problem when you have no standards? You allow yourself to sink to the very bottom. And that is quite often our common tendency. I wanted to talk to you about raising a standard in this church. Now I know you guys all think I'm crazy and I'm used to that. I'm not choosing this standard. This, this standard has actually been chosen for us. This is beyond anything I would have ever come up with. And I think if you look at the way you set your standards for Christianity, I wonder if any of them have looked like this. Now... This standard comes from a great man. And great people set great standards for themselves and for others. This great man is St. Basil the Great, the one who wrote the liturgy. And this is what he wrote. The standard of Christianity, like the, just the standard, is the imitation of Christ in the measure of his carnation according to the duty of each man's calling. The standard is to imitate Christ. That's not like the highest level. That's just the standard. Now, I really want you to focus on that last part. Because as Deacon Swiros mentioned today, that sometimes we say, well, that is for monks and bishops and priests. But he says, according to the duties of each man's calling. If you have a nine to five job and you sit behind a computer or you deliver mail, or you're a stay at home mom and you're raising kids, or you're a tax collector or a banker or a professor or a teacher or a movie maker. Imitating Christ in your call of duty. That is the standard that is set for you. Now, I want to call this not just a standard, but this is the highest standard. Do you remember we began this year with a resolution? We called it the greatest resolution of all time. The greatest resolution was to live according to the highest standard. That the goal of 2015 at Holy Transfiguration Church is that we would begin this. This is not something that just happens to be. 
This standard is something that we're invited to. It's not being imposed on us. We're invited to participate in this standard. We're actually commanded to obey this standard. We're strengthened by God to accomplish this standard. And believe it or not, we were created for this purpose. For this standard, we were created. I don't feel like many Christians I know have this as their standard. I don't think this was really ingrained in my mind growing up as an Orthodox Christian. That the goal of my life is not to be saved. Or to go through a Coptic fast without gaining weight. Or to read the Bible in a year. Those are not the goals of my life. And oftentimes we lose sight of what the real goal is. And I want you to realize the ultimate goal of our lives is theosis. Theosis. What is theosis? It's the understanding that human beings can have real union with God. And so become like God to such a degree that we can participate, or as St. Peter says in the epistle that was read today, Partake in the divine nature that we can become like God. Not in His essence. Not that you could be all-knowing and all-powerful and all-present. But we can participate in what we call the energies of God. Now, does this sound crazy? Well, let me just read this other quote first. This idea of theosis. There's so many amazing, amazing father sayings that Deacon Sears was talking to us about today, but here's one that I, I liked. It says, On that day when God will be all in all, we will no longer to be captive to our sinful passions, but we will be entirely like God, ready to receive into our hearts the whole God and God alone. This is the perfection to which we press on. I'm hoping that we will change the direction of your life. The goal is not to be a Christian or to be a good Christian. It is to be a Christ-like Christian. I mean, does it sound crazy for us to imitate Christ? Let me say this. When God created man, He created us in His own image and His own likeness. Meaning, we have certain qualities that are in us that are already God-like, such as rational thinking and free will and authority. That's kind of the image that we have of God, but there's also this potential to be like Him. And what I want to say is, God gave us the spiritual DNA. When He made you, He made you to be like Him. Could you imagine if you were to gather, you know, the most intelligent people on the earth and the strongest people on earth and, you know, like the most, you know, resourceful and then you get them all together and they all like have children and then out of that become a bunch of like, you know, generation Xers, right? With very low goals, very low accomplishments and, you know, like they just want to play video games all day and, you know, do whatever. You say, wait a minute, you have the world's best DNA. I mean, I didn't want to quote this, but like, you know the movie Twins? Yes. I mean, that was based on, you have Arnold Schwarzenegger. And here's the scraps. And the scraps left over. Danny DeVito. Like, we were given the potential to be like the model. And I'm afraid that a lot of us have set our standards to be like the scraps. But this is inside of you. And actually, we can participate in His love, His compassion, His grace, His mercy. We can partake of Him in communion. This potential was given to us through the incarnation when Christ came to be among us, when He died on the cross to heal our sins, when He rose from the dead to conquer death, when He ascended to heaven to open the doors of heaven, and when He gave us the Spirit which will allow us as we pray every day, the Spirit that proceeds from the Father and 
sanctifies the creation and teaches us to worship. This is all part of God's plan for us to imitate Christ. And if you don't believe me, I just grabbed a few verses, not all of them. But see if this makes sense. In Romans 8, 28, For whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. You were predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. St. Paul says this in his service. He's serving these people. He says, My little children for whom I labor in birth again. And I've heard that labor pains are rough. He says, I'm doing it again. For what purpose? I will do whatever it takes so that Christ will be formed in you. St. Paul tells us in Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. This is God's plan from the beginning. This is what Christ told us to do. This is what those who knew Him are doing. This is why God sent His Son. To renew the image of His Son within us that was lost. We say this in the Gregorian liturgy. He desired to renew us to our original state. So what does that mean? This imitation of Christ, how do we do it? What does it look like? There's this book called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. It's written by St. John Climacus. It's 30 steps that kind of lead you from the basics to holiness, to become like God. And in the first chapter, the first chapter is this quote. A Christian is an imitator of 